Americans all remember Pearl Harbor. It was what drew the nation into World War II. But what got us into World War I 24 years earlier? There's a good argument that it was due to the egos of two American presidents. The story begins at the start of the past century. It begins with Theodore Roosevelt, the president often revered for his moves to break up dangerous business trusts and to help conserve America's natural beauty. The reality was that Republican Party bosses, such as Mark Hanna, had never intended for Teddy to be president. His nomination for vice president at the Republican convention in 1900 was actually meant to keep Teddy from causing more trouble in New York State for the party machine. Unfortunately for them, President William McKinley was shot dead by an anarchist shortly after his second term began, which put Teddy in the Oval Office, leaving Mark Hanna to mourn, now that damn cowboy is president. Roosevelt ruled for almost all of that term, then ran for another term in 1904. Deciding he had reached the traditional two-term limit imposed by the practice of President George Washington, Roosevelt chose his successor, the hefty William Howard Taft, in 1908 and retired to become an elder statesman. The only problem was that Teddy's ego wouldn't let him stay retired. Within a short time, he decided that Taft wasn't running the government the way he would and decided the perfect replacement for Taft would be, you guessed it, Theodore Roosevelt. As you might imagine, the Republican Party wasn't keen to be pushed around by a single person, even an ex-president. So at its national convention in 1912, it nominated Bill Taft once again. Had Teddy taken the loss in a mature fashion, Taft would have been re-elected and many nasty things wouldn't have happened. But instead of staying retired, Roosevelt ran as a third party candidate in 1912 for the Progressive or Bull Moose Party. America was still strongly Republican in those days. Taft and Roosevelt received almost 8 million votes, nearly 2 million more than Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Unfortunately, by splitting that vote, Roosevelt guaranteed that Wilson would be elected. In the next eight years, a lot of bad things happened, thanks to Teddy Roosevelt's ego. Before Woodrow Wilson took over, America had no income tax and no federal reserve system. The term sound as a dollar was commonly heard because the dollar had hardly changed value in a century. Woodrow Wilson would change all that. Wilson was a former professor and president of Princeton University whose oddball political ideas were about as off base as those of most professors today. Wilson was one of the first to declare the Constitution a living thing, meaning that it should be changed to fit the needs and beliefs of any given time, namely, his beliefs. Wilson thought unelected officials, that is, bureaucrats, would be more receptive to the public than politicians who needed votes, and we've seen how that works in the century since. But Wilson's biggest mistake was getting America into the First World War. Thanks to Teddy Roosevelt's ego, we had Woodrow Wilson. And thanks to Woodrow Wilson's ego, we were going to have not one, but two world wars in the first half of the 20th century, costing tens of millions of lives. Historians have tried to explain America's entry to the war with many things, but they don't hold up. The sinking of the ocean liner Lusitania is often given as a reason, but that sinking occurred two full years before the U.S. went to war. In addition, the Lusitania was a British ship, not American, and Germany had repeatedly warned Americans not to sail on British ships during the war. 120 Americans died in the sinking. Germany also charged that the Lusitania was not only carrying passengers, but also arms for the British, bought from the U.S. Years later, divers found four million rounds of rifle ammunition stored inside the wreck. When the Lusitania was sunk, anger in the United States reached stratospheric levels. Many people called for America to enter the war right then. But one person who didn't was Woodrow Wilson. In fact, when Wilson ran for re-election the next year, his primary campaign slogan was, he kept us out of war. And he had, only to get us into war as soon as his second inauguration was over. But why? Germany had declared its submarines would attack all ships headed to Britain, but Britain had been blockading Europe since the war began. The U.S. had seen the Zimmermann telegram with Germany promising Mexico territory if it declared war on the U.S., 
But Mexico knew that every time it tangled with the U.S., it got smaller, not bigger, and Americans knew that as well. Britain was in need of help, but so was Germany. Both sides in the battle were nearly exhausted by the spring of 1917. 30,000 British soldiers had died in January of that year alone. Until the spring of 1917, fewer than 200 Americans had died in sinkings of Allied ships. In the next year and a half, more than 100,000 American soldiers would die in the war. The most likely reason Wilson wanted to get into the war was to make the world safe for democracy, which might be taken to mean to make Woodrow Wilson world famous. Wilson had issued his 14 points that he believed should be applied to a post-war world, but he also knew that if the U.S. didn't enter the war, no one would listen to his plans and no one would give him credit for the peace. So America joined the fight. Apparently, making the world safe for democracy involved some very undemocratic actions. A week after Congress declared war, Wilson issued an executive order setting up the Committee on Public Information, a group that used propaganda and occasional threats to make sure the public backed the war effort. In those pre-radio days, it produced posters that made Germans seem subhuman and enlisted its own army of four Minutemen to spread the pro-war story with short speeches in towns around the nation. For instance, preparing citizens for the draft coming up on June 5th of 1917. That summer, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which made it illegal to use disloyal or abusive language about the Constitution, the government, or the American flag, greatly restricting citizens' First Amendment rights. And it was not just for show. More than 2,000 people were prosecuted before the war ended, including socialist Eugene Debs, who had run against Wilson in 1912. Debs wasn't freed until Wilson was out of office in 1921. The fresh troops did make the difference, and Germany gave up in November of 1918. Wilson was indeed hailed as a hero when he went to the peace conference just outside Paris. What he didn't know was that he had sowed the seeds that would result in Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany just 14 years later. Had America stayed out, the exhausted European nations would likely have come to a peace agreement, leaving things much as they were before the war. But America's aid allowed Britain and France to rip huge swaths of their opponents' land from them. Germany lost all its lands in Africa and the Pacific to France and Britain, and even chunks of its land in Europe. But worse was to come. Wilson's diplomatic naivete meant that Britain and France were able to force Germany to admit guilt for starting the war and demand repayment for every franc and pound they had spent fighting. The moral and financial burden almost collapsed Germany and made it possible for a raving megalomaniac like Adolf Hitler to take over in the 1930s. Even Wilson didn't get to enjoy the results of his war. At the Versailles Peace Conference, he was seriously ill, likely from the Spanish flu epidemic that killed 50 million people worldwide that year. Once back in the U.S., he suffered a stroke that left him bedridden for a year and a half, with his new wife likely serving as shadow president for him. And the U.S. Senate rejected Wilson's 14 points, meaning the United States never became part of Wilson's treasured League of Nations. All that death, all that damage done to the world that had to be repaired later, and it might have been all due to the egos of two powerful men.